One of the challenges of knitting intarsia projects is how to manage the yarn to minimize tangling, as well as estimating the amount of yarn needed to knit an individual motif. In this week's Technique Tuesday video, I'll demonstrate four approaches for managing yarn for these types of projects. We'll look at the advantages and disadvantages of each approach and why you might choose different approaches for different projects. I'll also show examples of several intarsia projects and explain which approaches were used in each project. If you'd like to jump right to a specific point in the video, you can tap or mouse over the video playback area of the screen to reveal the chapter titles and starting points of each section. This first method is one that I consider to be sort of a continuous feed method. It doesn't require winding off separate smaller balls of yarn. Um, it is most useful if you only have a few color changes in a row. Theoretically, there's no limit to the number of balls of yarn you could have, but there is a practical limit. So I have three separate balls and they're feeding directly onto here. Nothing is tangled at this point. Everything is coming directly off of the yarn. So I'm starting a right side row with everything in the correct order, everything, nothing's tangled at this point. And I'm going to work across the row. So it's time for me to change colors. So I'm going to do what I would always do, which is to bring the white yarn that's connected to the needle over to the left so that I can pick up the new color from underneath it. I'm not doing anything with the actual balls of yarn. I'm just linking those two yarns together and then continuing on. Now it's time to change to the next one. So again, I'm keeping this one over uh, to the left and I bring the new one up here. So now I can swing that old one underneath. Continue on. So I've got to the end of the row. I haven't moved the balls of yarn, but what you will see is that the yarns are all linked together. They all have a single link. And so if you had 10 balls of yarn, you'd, you'd have the same thing, the first one would be linked to the second one, uh, the second one would be linked to the third, and the third to the fourth. So you get this little chain going across, but it's not a complete mess all tangled around. So at this point, you need to turn your work. So you need to do it in a consistent way. You need to do it the same, every time you get to the end of a right side row, you need to do it the, to do it the same way. So the way I do it is I point this tip that has the working yarn hanging from it away from me in order to swing it around this way. And now you've added a, a, a twist so that all of the yarns are twisted around each other at this point. And now you purl across. I have the yarn in my left hand and so I keep the yarn over here and bring this, the new yarn up here and letting the old one fall to fall below. If, however, I was working with the yarn in my right hand, the process uh, would be the same thing. I'll work this last stitch with the yarn in my right hand. If I had the yarn in my right hand, I worked this last stitch, I still would bring this yarn over to my left hand in order to bring the new yarn up. So it's the same process regardless of which hand you use to handle the working yarn. You always bring the old yarn to the left if it's not there already and then pick up the new yarn. And then I can continue on. Okay, so I just finished the last stitch of my purl row, and so now it's going to be time to turn the work again. Again, you have to always turn the work in the same way for purl rows, but it will be the opposite way you turned it for knit rows. So for the, for when I finished a knit row, I turned this tip away from me. Uh, at the end of a purl row, I'm going to turn that tip toward me so that I'm taking out that little twist. So now you look at these yarns and what do you see? If you, if you look at them, they're all separated away from each other. So you link them together during a knit row. You turn, if you're turning this tip away after the end of a knit row, then at the end of a purl row, you'll turn it back this way. 
you can do it the opposite way. You just need to be consistent. So again, this is really good when you don't have that many color changes. This is the technique that I'm currently using for this project, which is my 1940s vintage project. I only have four color blocks in each row. And so I just have a, a ball of gray, a ball of yellow, a ball of purple, and a ball of gray on the desk in front of me. And then I can keep knitting with uh, the full cake of yarn on my desk. I don't have to wind up bobbins or butterflies of yarn in order to work the pattern. The classic method for handling yarn with intarsia is to use what are called bobbins. So these are these little pieces of plastic. They come in different shapes, but typically they have a, a place for you to wind up yarn and then they have a place for you to anchor the strand. However many areas, blocks of color you have, you'd have a bobbin for each one of those. The advantage of this method is that it doesn't require you to have a surface where you have all of the balls of yarn lined up. The yarn is always attached to the place where it is needed in the fabric, and so it's always available to you. Uh, the disadvantage is that you've always got these little bobbins swinging down and the more color changes you have, the narrower those blocks of color are, the more risk there is of the bobbins twisting around each other. Now, one way that you can help reduce the, the, the chance of these tangling around each other is to keep the, the distance between the fabric and where the yarn is anchored to be pretty short. Now, if you're like me, I need a fair amount of yarn in my hand so that I could have the yarn wound through my hands in order to work the stitches. So then when I'm done with them, if I let it go, this is very long, which allows it to wrap around all of the other ones. And so in order to avoid that, uh, once I would get to the end of this right here, I'd need to wind this back up again. Now for me, I don't like this uh, option of uh, winding it back up because it just interrupts my knitting rhythm. I would rather just be able to knit across um, as quickly as I can without having to stop to unwind and then stop to wind up again each time. If you can knit uh, with just a, a couple of inches of yarn, if you can, can knit with just the, the yarn over your index finger so you don't really need very much, that can help keep that strand really short. There's also this type of bobbin, which is like a, a silicone spool, and this cup right here is larger in circumference than that, so that you can wind the yarn loosely around the bobbin and then you can close this, allows you to just pull out yarn as you need it. So again, if you can keep the distance between the bobbin and your fabric fairly short, if the weight of the bobbin is enough to give you tension so that you can knit your stitches, then this can be a better solution than something like this. So this next method I wanna show you is creating what are called butterflies that acts as a center pole ball. So the advantage of a butterfly over a bobbin would be you don't have any additional weight uh, that you would get from the bobbin. And they also allow you to release yarn as you need it uh, rather than having to unclip and unwind. The disadvantage would be that once you've let release up a, a certain amount of yarn, you can't wind it up again without rewinding the entire butterfly. Again, if you can knit where you don't have to have a whole lot of, of yarn between the fabric and your yarn source, if you can just knit with uh, a little bit of yarn over one finger rather than having it tensioned around many fingers like this, then this can work uh, really well and you can avoid some of that tangling. So let me show you how you do a, a butterfly. There are a couple of different ways of doing it. This is the way I learned, it's not the only way. So the yarn is attached to the fabric right here. So I bring it up across my palm um, in between um, these two fingers. So I bring it across here like that. And then I'm just wrapping it around in a figure eight around, back and forth around my fingers um, for as long as the strand is that I am 
winding. So when I come around uh, the final time and it's, I just have a little bit of tail, I bring it over uh, around the figure eight and then over the top of this loop like that, creates a little half knot and I just cinch it shut. And so the yarn is going to feed out from here as if it's a center pull. The fourth method is to not wind yarn onto a bobbin or into a butterfly, but just wind off maybe a yard or two of yarn and let it hang from your work. Uh, and, and then as you work across, when you need to have access to a particular yarn, you just pull it out. They might be all tangled up around each other. You just get the one you want and you pull it out of the mess. This is a good technique if you're working a very small area that doesn't have a lot of stitches. So you're just working something that's going to have a few stitches over a couple of rows. You could just uh, have maybe um, a foot of yarn hanging from there and that would be sufficient to handle that small area. Um, this is probably, this is not such a great idea if you're doing very large blocks of color where you're going to need more yarn. Uh, it can work if you are using a feltable yarn. So this is a, a wool that is not machine washable. So if I needed to add another length of yarn to the end of this, I could spit felt uh, additional yarn to the end of this and keep going uh, on and on. Really though, the, the strand method is suitable for intarsia where you might have many, many color changes and some of those are very small. So here is a project where I would have used a combination of techniques. I would let this amount of yarn just hang in a strand, um, but for the background areas, I would have used something like bobbins because I just need to fill in a lot more stitches with a lot more yarn. When you have many color changes, so some of these rows I might've had 12 or 14 changes, but when I'm going across these poppies, I had somewhere around 20, somewhere between 25 and 30 different color changes. So I would have used a combination of techniques um, for this situation. So here's a situation where I sometimes used butterflies and I sometimes used dangling strands. So when I had a row like this where I had these red diamonds, I would have a separate butterfly for each of the red diamonds and a separate butterfly for the background that was in between those. But this area right here where I have these diagonal lines that start at a point and go out in that direction and they're single stitches, in this area I could use one ball of yarn for the entire background and I would use a single strand for each of these V's right here. I would wind off a length of yarn uh, to, to knit one of these V's with and when I establish that first a stitch right there, I would use the center of this strand in order to knit that stitch. When I came back across in the, on the next row, uh, I would be working with my background color and then I would use this end, this tail right here, to knit that stitch. Use the, my same ball of cream color to do that one and then I'd use this end of the yarn to do that stitch there. So as it separated in that direction, I would be using it more and more of this part of the strand uh, for here and more and more of this part of the strand for there. So it is possible to combine techniques sometimes in the same row, but sometimes it might be in different sections. When I'm creating butterflies for motifs or dangling strands, I like to estimate the actual amount of yarn I'm going to need to create one of these motifs. So the process is to count up the number of stitches that are going to be in that motif and divide it by your stitch gauge. What that tells you is that if these stitches were all lined up in one row, how wide that span of stitches would be. And then you can calculate, well, how much yarn do you need for a span of stitches that that's that wide? However wide that span of stitches would be, you'd need three times that much yarn in order to knit all of them. So 41 stitches divided by five stitches per inch would be 8.25. 
and then I would multiply that by three, so that's 24.75. So about 25 inches of yarn to knit one of these diamonds. And then I need to add four to six inches at each end for a yarn tail that I can then weave in. In knitting, there are always multiple ways of getting to the same end point, and that is certainly true when it comes to yarn management for intarsia projects. There's never a best way of doing something that will be uniformly true in all situations for all knitters. Knowing what your options are will help you choose the solution or solutions that are best for you and your project. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. And if you aren't already a subscriber, please consider doing so. If you have any comments or questions about today's video or suggestions for videos you'd like to see in the future, you can leave those down in the comments below or join the discussion in my Ravelry group, Rocks Rocks. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.